Welcome to HVAC Success Secrets Revealed, a show where we interview industry leaders and disruptors, revealing the success secrets to create and unleash the ultimate HVAC business. Now your hosts, Thaddeus and Evan. Hey, welcome back. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. We appreciate you. Yeah. Uh, welcome back to the audience to another HVAC Success Secrets Revealed, where we have good conversations with good people, and any good conversation worth having is worth having drunk. So <laughs> cheers, gentlemen. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. You know, thank you. I unfortunately do not have a drink. I shared this with you earlier. I'm not feeling well. But if I did have a drink, do you know what it would be? I don't. What would it be? Whiskey. I'm going to go with whiskey because it's Whiskey Wednesday. Whiskey Wednesday. All right. Um, no, it would be a White Claw. Oh. Now, I've never had a White Claw, <laughs> but there's a reason that I'm sharing that that we can get to later um, because I had, man, I'm just going to jump right into it here if you don't mind. Yeah. Last, So I have four children and last week, um, my 17-year-old, soon to be 18-year-old boy was walking downstairs and he's like, hey, dad, I'm going to a friend's house. And he walked out of the house and I heard clink. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, Corey, my wife, Corey, I'm, I'm going to go check on Aiden. So I was like, Aiden, what's in your bag? And he's like, uh, change of clothes, like a hoodie. I'm like, a hoodie, it's 95 degrees. So I look in his bag and sure enough, he had Trulies in there, right? <laughs> so Trulies are a thing apparently. And in talking with some other people, I found out that like there's this worldwide shortage of white claw. And it truly came into the market. And it's basically the same thing with like one fewer carb or something like that. Right. But it's a seltzer alcohol of like 5%. And uh, it's completely disrupting the lion's share of the market that White Claw had. Mm. And they're unbelievably refreshing. So like as so easy. part of my, so you've had one then. Yes. Absolutely. So yeah, I've not had white claw, but I had to truly. So as part of my son's punishment, you know, he wasn't quite sure where this whole thing was going to go and I'll leave that off air. Um, but he's like, oh man, when's the other foot going to drop? But we kept the Trulies in the refrigerator, right? That he had to stare at. And then mom and I took him to the pool and they were unbelievably refreshing, mm -hmm. but it got me thinking about the concept of a com like new categories. And that's what, what's what we're doing at contractor mm -hmm. commerce is creating a new category. But anyways, man, how are you guys? I didn't even let you introduce me yet. <laughs> <laughs> See, I was thinking about this. I'm like, how is this going to work when we have a, a co-host of a podcast on as a guest on a podcast with two co-hosts? Right, like it's it's going to be three co-hosts trying to all vie for their own for their attention. Totally. And, and my natural disposition is just ask questions out of curiosity. So, like, I warned you guys last night that I may be interviewing you. And um, I'm okay with that. If you guys are okay with that, we'll just see where it goes. We'll see where it goes. We can, we can flip the script for today. Sure. Yeah. 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 Tell me what you don't like about yourself, Evan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what was that Friends episode where she, chapter one, my first period, why I hate myself. <laughs> <laughs> not familiar. No, not a Friends fan. Oh, not, you know, I, I, in, I enjoy it. Like I get it, but I'm just not, I never watched a lot of TV growing up, which is another story that I just won't get into. But I've seen nothing. Like I just watched Top Gun, um, and the reason I watched Top Gun was because um, I was in a meeting with Chris Yano, and he said something. He's like, "You're my um, what did he call me? I don't know, like his wingman or your goose, your uh, goose." Your and I was like, "What does that even mean?" <laughs> and so I had to look it up, and then I watched the movie. What a great movie! It's oh, a phenomenal, really fantastic, movie. phenomenal movie. Um, and they've actually they're actually, they're actually supposed to be coming out exactly as we'll say. They yeah. have a next one coming out. Um, with it, it, they was actually, I think it was supposed to release like 2020, but due to the pandemic, they, they pushed it off uh, yeah. and they're waiting uh, on it. But like, just when you go back and actually look like, you know, when they're in the, they're and it wasn't, um, like some of them, a lot of them, you see like, ah, it's all CGI. They legitimately flew in fighter planes. I mean, they yeah. were in the back behind, behind the pilot and the pilot was doing everything, but like, what a crazy experience if you're an actor to be like, okay, let's go shoot a movie about fighter jets and I'm going to ride in a fucking fighter jet. Yeah. Like. Man, I probably would have passed out on the G forces, but well, you know the the scene where they're playing on the piano in the bar. Yes, yeah. So that bar is actually across the street from the Hyatt in San Diego, mm -hmm. Kansas City Barbecue. And so I went and I had uh, had a little. Well, I had a basket of fries. I don't eat meat, so people I were with all had brisket and stuff like that. But yeah, we got to hang out in the the bar from the movie, so that was pretty cool. Did you start singing? Of course. So you don't eat meat. Is this a, a newer thing or when did you become no, a vegan? No, it's been like eight years. Yeah, it's okay. been about eight years for me. Yeah. yeah. 
Got it. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Why um, your prevention of COVID nineteen is eating plants? Exactly. Right. Yeah. So good. We had to talk <laughs> earlier. It's actually it's actually kind of funny because he's he's total uh, veg, or vegan, and I hunt and eat a lot of meat. So we're like great <laughs> business partners in that sure. sense. Uh, yeah. you know, complete polar opposites, but we complement each other. It's perfect. You yeah. you got to have that. You really do. So. <laughs> yeah. Oh, here we go. Let's start this off. Let's just go right for the bang here. Uh, Devin Harrison, love you guys. Don't forget to ask about Paul's best jokes. Yeah. Oh my gosh, here. Devin, appreciate you, brother. Yes. I don't even know. Is this this is something that you guys normally ask somebody? No, no, not at all. Oh. No, Devin's um, just Devin's just on it. He's decided <laughs> oh. to, to say hey. Dude, uh, Devin, Devin Harrison, by the way, phenomenal person, phenomenal person. Devin, I got something for you. Okay. This is not, I'm going to share this with you and you can give this gift to your family tonight. We're going to go dad joke. Okay. Love it. I invented a dad joke, just one. And I think it's brilliant. Let me see if I can set this up. Right. Okay. Hey, Evan. Hey, wouldn't it be just nuts if there was no candy in trail mix? <laughs> Get it? Trail mix has M and M's in it, but if you took out the M and M's, it would just be nuts. Just Wouldn't be it? nuts. I didn't, it that is. didn't land. I, I should have said. No, I, I got it. That was great. It's well, a, it, it, makes you, it makes you. It makes you think a little bit. Yeah, it I think it'd be better if you had a bag of the trail mix with the M and M's in it, because like right. there's like 20 different types of trail mix yeah. uh, that you can get. But I love that. There you go, but Devin. Only nuts. Devin. Only nuts. Devin. <laughs> only nuts. Devin. <laughs> only nuts, man. I I have to take trail mix and I have to partition the trail mix in small little bags because mm. I'll eat like 15 servings of trail mix. And my wife, who is um, very uh, environmentally conscious, will not let me use plastic bags. So I have to find other ways. But anyways, where are we on this podcast? Where did we start? Where are we right now? Well, we're about <laughs> seven minutes in and we're getting to okay. the intro now. So this is perfect. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> Um, well, and I'll finish up the Devin thing. Him and I actually have an ongoing conversation for the last like two weeks of, I don't know, 150 jokes back and forth. So it's just constant one-liners, dad jokes. It's delightful. Yeah, let Highlight go. of my day. Um, welcome. Yeah. Paul, Paul. So grateful to have you on the show, my man. Uh, for those of you who don't know, and you haven't heard of To The Point Podcast, Tall Paul is the co-host of To The Point uh, Home Service Podcast. Uh, it's a fantastic show. I really love listening to it. And I love the narrative that's been created by, I mean, a marketing company with Rhino Strategic Solutions. And then with us, with On Purpose Media, where we're just looking to give back and add value to a lot of people. And um, I think you guys are nailing it with the show. And I'm really excited to have you on today. And now with your new venture and, and diving into e-commerce with Contractor Commerce and yeah and bringing that whole scope into the mix and how contractors can really protect themselves and increase their revenues and drive sales today and moving forward into the next decade, two decades as sales continue to be driven online. So I'm yeah. excited for this conversation today. Yeah. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. We're hiring, by the way, you explained that really well. But um, <laughs> hey, quick shout out to the team at To The Point. You know, since we're giving away secrets here, I'll give you a secret to some of our success there that I hope they're okay with me sharing. Um, one of the things that I found has been, uh, has really attributed to the success in, in return listeners and people who really stick with it is really good audio quality. So mm -hmm. mixture of producer Ryan, producer Kyle, the OG who kind of started uh, the podcast with us, they do a really good job of making sure that one, Chris and I are prepared and we've got the right equipment and tools like you're looking at here. Um, but you know, just making sure that our guests sound good because nothing's worse than you, you dial into a podcast and you have to like, you hear that airy noise. Like it's really like I can think of a few podcasts where I was out immediately just because of sound. So totally. there's a, so if I don't give any success secrets, there's a success secret. The other one is consistency, which you guys get, like mm -hmm. you guys are on the hour every Wednesday, 2 PM mountain time, you roll, um, you know, at, to the point, you know, we're committed to launching an episode every single week. And sometimes that means we're recording like on vacation or, um, you know, three, three episodes on a Wednesday afternoon. So, yeah. um, that's been the consistent, it's, it's so hard to stay consistent with it. And that's where I think most podcasts fall short. So, but yeah. I love it. Um, Chris and I have a blast doing it. And the, the best thing for us is we're actually, we're learning a ton, like his business, my business, they're all, all, every time we leave an interview, we're like, oh my gosh, what did you take away? So yeah. Yeah. Um, sometimes we truly, truly, we say it, but we truly forget we're interviewing someone. We're just, or, or we truly forget we're, you know, producing something. We're just like, Oh my gosh, it's like free education. 
So well, we love and, and you nailed it. Like anybody that you know, podcasts are huge. A lot of people are, and you, you're starting to see those Spotify mm-hmm. and the ads that they're putting in and purchasing Joe Rogan's podcast uh, and, and everything there. But there's a lot that goes into it. And yeah. you know what we, for the first time last week, didn't have a show. Um, mm-hmm. And it wasn't, it was designed on purpose that way. We were in a coaching class and in a program and we wanted to give our attention to our coaching program so we could sharpen our saw. But people don't, people are like, oh, start a podcast and they launch, you know, 10 episodes and then they fall flat on the face. And it's like, okay, well, we're season two, we're season three, we're season four. You have to cut consistently find great guests to bring on the show when it becomes, uh, it can be cumbersome for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, they forget that. They, well, it's, it's easy. They just drink whiskey. No, there's a lot that goes into it. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say the work that really goes in the work of finding good quality guests and preparing and then going back and forth about setting up a time and all that kind of stuff. Um, Chris and the team do a tremendous job of that. And Chris is one of those people that, you know, you can tell him no, that you're not interested in coming on our podcast, but you will be on our podcast. That's just how he operates. There's another success secret. Like just be absolutely relentless with what you want. So totally. Yeah. know what you want and go after it. Well, yeah. I would love to, to hear a little bit more about your story and how you got to where you're at now. I know you started uh, in a distribution center, right? With Lennox and, yeah. and worked your way up from there as a territory rep. So we'd love to hear a little bit of that background story. Yeah. Do you want the long story or the short story? Because I can give you the I mean, long story. You can make one. a long story short or a short story longer, whichever you I'll, prefer. I'll do both and I'll try to, I'll try to skip along um, and give you the highlights. So um, I'm from Dayton, Ohio, which is, um, you probably don't know where Dayton, Ohio is from, from your vantage point. Um, but I grew up there, um, seven brothers and sisters and uh, all over the country. That's another long story. I don't, I don't even want to get into that, but um, was the first generation uh, or the first person in my family to go to a four-year college. So went and played basketball right. and um, had a really good opportunity to, to get a college degree and all of that. Um, and my wife and I had just kind of always, she was from the area to I met her in college. We'd always kind of like, you know, been looking West. We just always wanted to, you know, venture Westward. I'm, I'm sparing a ton of details. So I get out of college. So I played division three basketball. So when most people hear that I played college basketball, they automatically assume like, oh, you got a scholarship. And I just kind of leave it like people just assume like, oh, you played college basketball. Oh, you went to Duke, right? Yeah. Went to Duke. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Wait, well, is there, is there a stereotype in there because you're six foot nine? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> And, just, wanted to, uh, just wanted to make sure. So people, and that's another story. We'll talk about Tall Paul and how that's kind of evolved over time. But, um, you know, people assume, you know, you may have gotten a scholarship. Well, in Division Three, there are no scholarships, right? Now you can get like $40,000. I'm sorry, there are no athletic scholarships, okay? So you can get academic scholarships and need-based scholarships and federal grants and loans and those sort of things. But you're like, you've got this patchwork of resources that you're using to pay for college, even though you're playing a sport. So I graduated college. Um, significantly in debt. And so did my wife. I mean, we had like really, really big student loan bills to pay. And I wasn't too worried about it because I knew I was going into business. I knew I would figure it out. I knew I had to get a college degree to get a seat at the table. Right. Right. And I know people will push back against that and argue against that and talk, talk about college versus, um, you know, versus trade schools and all that. I grew up, my, my dad passed away when I was nine. I was not mechanical. I didn't have any of those things. I was really self-conscious about it. I knew I had to get into the corporate world somehow. And I knew, at least just from people telling me, like, hey, you've got to have a college degree to do it. So I say all that to say um, I um, wanted to move to Colorado. I'm, I'm right out of college, you know, a year out, and I'm making like $30,000 a year, right? And my wife and I have a baby, right? So we're thinking about that move. We're planning that move and I'm sparing a lot of details, but the, um, the thing that, that the kind of the, the turning point was I was asking people about um, real estate in Colorado. And I met this lady who had this friend she went to high school with who lived in Colorado and you owned a heating company. And she connected me with him to talk about like where we could rent an apartment. Right. And we're like white knuckled, like we're moving out there. We have no money. Right. And the company I'm with is going to let me transfer all of this. And he happened to be a heating contractor and he met me and said, oh, you remind me of this guy that I met who used to be my territory manager. He got promoted. You'd be you'd be great. And I'm like 20, I guess, 24 at this time. Um, And so they brought me out to Colorado and they brought me in as a territory manager. I didn't really know anything about the business, um, but I was hungry and I was humble and I learned and um, I called on a, you know, a, a dozen people I can name who helped me kind of learn the business. Um, and so fast forward, I did that job as one of the highest performing, um, uh, territory managers in the country, multiple, um, 
measurements. I, I can't even remember, but did really, really well. And um, got a call one day, had had a couple calls about coming down to the corporate office and being promoted and had really pushed back against that. My wife and I loved Colorado. And I got a call from a guy who I, I admire and adore. And um, he offered me the opportunity to come down and basically help put a blueprint together for the digital landscape that the team, that the, that the corporate office is going to execute over a period of time. Mm-hmm. So long story short, moved to Dallas, spent a couple of years there, worked in marketing, worked in brand, worked on digital tools and all those sort of things. And then um, about six years ago, was sent out to run one of our districts, which is North and South Carolina. And um, yeah, that's kind of my story. So um, all that to say along that way, um, I just kept getting deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and caring and caring more and more about my customers and more and more about the business. And I wake up one day and I'm like, this is, this is a career. I'm in this for the long run. This is what I do. Hmm. Wow. I love, it. I love, I love the hungry and humble part. Yeah. You know, that's, I... that's massive. Like it's actually, well, and it's kind of funny that you mentioned that we have a logo on our website. Um, it's hungry, hungry, uh, hungry, humble hustle. Or maybe yeah. it's humble, hungry hustle. Uh, and so always be humble, but always stay hungry. And then you just got to hustle your, your ass off and be able to get what you want. You know? Yeah. That's, and that's and a key thing. I have to attribute um, Chad Peterman for the concept of hungry, humble, smart. He taught me that, but that's exactly kind of uh, exactly what, what I applied early in the career. Sure. Well, let's, uh, Evan, unless you want to do anything, let's jump into Devin Harrison's questions. He's asking some great ones. Uh, on well, let's try and, and set these up right because he's asking about you know how do we implement an online store. So tell us a little oh, about yeah. what contractor um, commerce is all about, and then yeah, absolutely we can we can set that up correctly. All right, so I'm going to take you back to Dallas, Texas. So I'm in Dallas, Texas. I'm working at the world headquarters for Linux, and um, you know this is such a cool job because one, my job was to learn, like just straight up learn for two years, but two. I really got to have, and I didn't appreciate it at the time, but really a macro view of all of North America, right? Mm -hmm. From Canada to Miami, to LA, to New York, you could kind of just see and talk and learn about the business. And as you scanned the country, there was this outlier. And there was this guy named Will in Ohio who um, just didn't fit in by any means, right? He was selling millions of dollars worth of stuff. Um, He had owned HVAC.com and was doing some different things. And I saw him at ACO one time and he had this giant semi truck with HVAC.com on the side. And so um, I was just curious and um, started a relationship with with Will, Will House, who I work with now. Um, and we just became friends. So we became friends and just kind of stayed in touch over the years. And when I left Lennox to uh, go to Rhino and start what we were doing there, um, we had started testing what he had built and called Contractor Commerce at the time, which was essentially... Um, the software that he used to become the leading e-commerce person for HVAC um, that he was allowing contractors to use so they could do HVAC. So I don't think that answered your question directly, Devin. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how I met met Will and Contractor Commerce and, and have since then shared this opinion with Will that um, it's unbelievably obvious that this is the way the market is going. And everyone can agree on every statement about consumers wanting pricing online and wanting to shop online and all of that. Everyone can agree that contractors have completely lost the filter business. We're just talking filters. We're not even talking systems and equipment and maintenance yet, which we will. Um, but that business has been gone. I mean, they're not even, contractors are barely barely even trying, right? Mm-hmm. It just doesn't, the technology's not there. They're not doing it. They've just let it go. Um, so we're on a mission to bring that back to contractors. We want contractors to get in on e-commerce and to you know have tools at their fingertips that they can use to participate in e-commerce with their customers or all across the country. So we can. Did I answer your question, Devin? I mean, that, that starts to get into it a little bit, and I think we'll we'll probably dive into the actual question here in a in a sec. But no, it's so I love one book that talks about. The, the idea and the concept of putting price openly and transparently right on your website, which is They Ask You Answer by Marcus mm-hmm. Sheridan. And it's a fantastic book. If you have not read it, it is, I mean, he took his pool business that was struggling through the recession and grew it massively to the point that then he started his own marketing agency, essentially taking his, his philosophies that he brought to his business and teaching it to mm-hmm. others. But it's this concept of just whatever questions and frustrations your customers have, put it openly and honestly on your website and get your staff to not only bring those questions back to you, but get them to write the content too and utilize your team. Um, right. It's a fantastic book and I highly encourage it for everyone to, to take a look at. But that is the number one thing that 
customers are constantly asking, what is the price? And you don't have to outright say like, this is the price of a furnace right on your website, or this is the price of a new AC right on your website. It's, this is the range. And here's why it would cost this much more. Here's why it would cost this much less and detail that information. But the thing that uh, I'm fascinated with it, with the e-commerce side, you know, you think of, well, where do people go when they're searching for these things? Well, they're going to Google. And as voice search continues to dominate, and uh, continue to grow, you know, now you're limiting yourself from 10 search results, uh, or I mean, 15, if you want to include the ads and LSA and all the other stuff, but um, down to one on voice search, right. they're going to recommend one company. And being able to recommend the one company that is offering e-commerce services through Google, I mean, who's to say that they're not going to do that? So okay, now is the, the time that companies really need to take advantage of this. Yeah. So how can a company, going to Devin's question now, um, best implement an online store to a growing HVAC company to drive traffic? And what are some of the biggest problems that they run into? Oh, man, great question. So there's, well, there's the full question right there. Yeah, um, really, really good question. So you have two options, Devin. You can either build it yourself or use contractor commerce. And I'm not trying to be arrogant with that answer, but it's like saying, what are the best ways to enjoy seltzer beer? You can have a truly or you can have a, a white claw. Like there's only two options. This is a new category that doesn't exist. Um, and it's we're we're uniquely positioned to partner with contractors to be able to offer this so that as things continue to evolve, they're prepared. I want to come back to something you mentioned earlier because you essentially described like foundational SEO, right? You want to answer your website wants to be able to answer the questions that consumers are asking through Google. I can't validate this with data, but I think anyone who doesn't even understand SEO could probably agree with this. I would have to believe that if a homeowner were searching for a pair of Ray-Bans, right? The website that has information about Ray-Bans or the website that has information about Ray-Bans and the ability to buy the Ray-Bans may over time rank better than the one that doesn't. And that's where we are as a country right now is, I'll, I'll give you another example. I was in one of the forums today and I read a post that someone had posted about um, hey, I went out to this. They they um, shared a screenshot um, of an email that came from a customer that said the customer was like, "Hey, I loved your presentation. You did a great job. It was perfect. I love your reviews. You're five thousand dollars more than anyone. I, there must be something wrong with your price. I can't I can't go with your company." And my heart hurts for that guy because I get it. He's probably worth it. But think about that story. Like, that's not new. That's the mm -hmm. same story that's been told. Every single day across North America since since the, since it was normal to have three contractors in your house, right? Someone's going to be more expensive. That conversation very soon is going to be like, these are the prices online at a variety of places. I expect your price to be right. Like they're going to be, there's, there's going to be a, um, the perception of transparency is going to be super, super important. And we all know we have different pricing and some are high and some are low. But like you said earlier, you know, can you give a range? Can you say some are not so expensive? Some are super expensive. It depends on your house. Let's come out and we'll tell you our company story and tell you how much the price is exactly going to be. Now, all that to say, there are consumers who through our platform have added systems to the cart and made a transaction. And when it happens, like we stop what we're doing, we pick up the phone and we try to figure out what's going on. And we're, we're starting to hear these stories. Um, a company in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, Savannah Air Factory, um, is using full, they're selling fully installed systems on their site. Um, a homeowner went on to look for, had had some contractors out, had um, priced some equipment, had done some Google searching local contractors. She found what she liked through their website and checked out, right? So that is happening. That's coming. Um, and to answer your question, Devin, you can do that through us. <laughs> so what you're saying is the best way to implement an online store for a growing HVAC company is to just hire contractor commerce and put it in your website. Yeah. Uh, yes, but no. Shame, I will shamelessly plug that a little bit. Yeah. No. Thank uh, you. I, and I want to. I'll take that a step further. So the challenge that I have, like as a, um, you know, as a business right now, is we are making e-commerce very, very easy and very intuitive for contractors. Right. A contractor can call me after this. Right. And we can set up a meeting and we can have a shop installed on their website tonight. Okay. That's a problem because the, the challenge is we've made it so easy that we're not changing the behavior. Now, if you're, if you're implementing Service Titan, you're not just plugging Service Titan into 
a machine in the wall and be like, hey, guys, we're on Service Titan. You're going through this really long, rigorous behavioral change in every functional area of the business. So for e-commerce to work, you have to deconstruct your entire business and look at it like this. I have an installation department. I have a service department. I have a maintenance department. I have an e-commerce department. How does the business across every functional area support e-commerce? So it starts with the people on the phone saying, hey, did you know you can sign up for this online? Did you know you can get your filters replaced, you know, drop shipments? Um, did you, you know, when a technician is checking out with, um, with a homeowner in the house with an iPad or whatever, um, but it, you must deconstruct the entire business because every pain or every, um, every touch point with the customer, there's an opportunity to talk about e-commerce, particularly if we're, I mean, we're just talking about existing customers with filters. Like that's very low hanging fruit. Totally. No, it's the easiest one for sure. Yep. Um, so Devin, it's easy, but it's not that easy because <laughs> it's it's really up to you. You've got to take it and you've got to say, I'm opening an e-commerce division. Yes. Well, and that's the difference between the company that would just put it on their website and hope and pray that it works out versus actually driving that aspect of the business and driving sales through it so that it can actually add to your bottom line, not take away from it in the expense. So well, and you also, when you, when, once you put it on your site, you'd be like, okay, now you're like, well, what do I need to do? I need to market that. Yes. You know, I need to tell people, you just can't hope in a prayer and put it up there. Yep. And, and if you're stuck like, well, shit, now I'm going to do some more marketing on that. Well, no, find a marketing partner on purpose media, cough, cough. Um, <laughs> that's us. Um, and, and have those conversations you know, with them or whoever it is that, you know, that's handling your marketing to make sure that you can drive the traffic to that, to make the investment in your e-commerce division worthwhile. Yep. Absolutely. Guys, we are hiring. I think I can't can express this enough. Um, <laughs> um, so today we had an, I had an interaction with a, a customer of ours down in Florida and they'd sold their first subscription. And so I called them to talk to them about it and congratulate them. It was a uh, maintenance agreement and Gator AC shout out to Gator AC. Right. Um, it was a customer that they had been out to years ago and had stopped renewing their maintenance and stopped re returning their calls. And they haven't been able to do the seasonal maintenance for like two or three years. And he just went onto their website and paid $22 to sign up for monthly auto draft for a maintenance agreement. And those are like, that sounds so little, sounds so simple, but that's huge, right? Awesome. It completely yeah. disrupted, you know, any other opportunity for someone else to gain that business. So, and, and just because it was there. Yeah. You've removed friction. Yep. Right. The, 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 the more frictionless, is that, is that even a word? Um, I think so. Yeah, sure. It is today. Um, the, the less friction that you create uh, in an offer and for somebody to purchase your product, the more you're going to sell of that because they, they, when they see resistance go up, they're going to back out. And so now that's easy. Like they do it on their own time. They can do it at one in the morning, whatever time that they're up searching on the webs. Yep. yep. So to add to that, then Devin also followed up with another question asking about, you know, when selling full systems on an online platform, do you still have a comfort advisor involved in that process? Um, or do you start removing those people from that? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. We're working with some some companies now that have multi-site locations who eventually view this as a supplement. So mm -hmm. maybe maybe a comfort advisor list or project manager, shout out to Ishmael, a project manager list um, experience. Where, where The way we view it now is that um, let's get the customer, the homeowner comfortable with the concept of online pricing. And then let's book an appointment for you, go, you to go out there and do your thing the right. way you would normally do it. Right. Um, but I do see it increasing efficiency. Um, I'll give you another really good use case. If you know, Travis Smith with Sky. Uh, yeah, he was on last week. last week. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yep. So um, he may, or, I hope he shared this with you, but um, you know, he has uh, Oregon Duckless is one of his brands, one of his companies, and he's got our shop feature yeah. enabled on his store. It's really cool. If you get a chance, go to Oregon Duckless and I mean, just, configure a duckless system and you'll you'll see kind of what my development team is up to it's pretty cool um and you can do split systems as well but anyways um they're getting their second big heat wave like coming next week like crazy crazy temperatures unforeseen did you see on facebook he posted one day that like we're not taking on new customers like if you're not a client of ours we're not going out and running an appointment so yeah. um we like, you know, we're watching this thing like a hawk from our contractor commerce command center, which is what we call it, unless you guys can help me come up with a better name. <laughs> and we see 13 quotes come up for Travis and we're like, what's going on? Like, is e-commerce here? Is this it? Right. Is this the, is this the tipping point? Well, what happened was Travis basically was telling people, look, um, if you want pricing on a mini split, I can't run someone out to your house right now to go through this dog and pony show, go to our website, 
configure how many heads you need, how many indoor units. Um, if you're comfortable with the range of pricing, we can schedule an appointment. So it was perfect. Like that's a that's another like perfect use case. And it's not like 99,000 <laughs> contractors will hear that and they'll have every reason why that's not effective. They're like, but mm -hmm. this, 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 but how do you know you don't need this condensate pump? How do you know you know, right? The consumer, it, they're used to this. You go online, you find out how much things cost. Sometimes they're not expensive. Sometimes they are. If you're not sure, you ask questions. You invite them in your home. Like it's yeah. pretty obvious, pretty straightforward. But for some well, reason, HVAC has got this block that this just won't, this won't happen. Well, I they mean, won't be able to, annoying. they won't be able to do the upsells, right? What about, right. The, what about the ductwork, right? Uh, do you want an air purifier? Well, you can still do that when you're there. Like, yeah. I mean, it's, it, they have something called on the online checkouts. It's called an order bump. <laughs> um, and I'm sure that anybody that has bought something online, you do your purchase. And then on the very bottom of the screen, it's got an arrow flashing to a little square to say, check this if you want this product, right? Um, guess what? You can still buy that product later, even if you don't buy it right then and there. And so like the, the deal isn't fully done until you're in the house. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And so a best practice for us today to answer your question, uh, Devin, is um, give your customers the ability to have that experience and have them book an appointment. And then you go out and do your thing like you've been doing it. And then when the day comes where nine out of 10 calls you're running, consumers are like, well, look what I found online. Look what I found online. Look what I found online. And those online prices are legitimate. And they're coming from, not to get like super conspiracy theories now, but they're coming from people like Train mm -hmm. or Daikin or Goodman or, Le I mean, I'm, just, I'm not picking on anyone. I'm just naming manufacturers and distributors. Yep. You can tell, the contractor can say, you can get a price on my website as well. And it includes installation and it includes a warranty and I'm right around the corner and this is right. So yep. to think that the, there's not a possibility that the contractors could potentially be bypassed by other organizations, again, manufacturers, distributors is very naive, right? I, I've heard people who I trust from multiple organizations say, we'll never bypass our channel partners, right? Um, but think about how many businesses have bypassed their channel partners. So, so now we're talking about like labor only models and those sort of things, which, which are not good. Some people will argue that those are good and I can see all sides of it. Um, but we're going to err on the side of the contractors. We're going to equip the contractors to do e-commerce with whoever they want to do. If they want to sell yep. whatever brand they want. Well, and I mean, you see that right now in the media space, right? Paramount having their own channel and Disney plus having their own app, you know, everyone's trying to compete with Netflix and trying to get airtime, but they're doing it by creating their own media brand as sure. opposed to having to go through cinema or television, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? They're cutting out the middleman and going straight to consumer. And I think the more that businesses realize that that is the future and mm -hmm. transparency is what is going to rule, um, the the ones that are going to adopt that the quickest are the ones that are going to win. So that kind of leads to my next question then is around this, when this starts to become common practice, two years from now, three years from now, next month, because you're just promoting it so well, um, you know, what is it that businesses then can do to really separate themselves? If everyone is offering an e-commerce option, how do they continue to separate themselves and create brand around what it is they're trying to do? I think part of it is you have to go all in. You can't mm. tiptoe and show a little bit of pricing. I think you need to have a Zappos type of experience on your website where a customer knows I can filter and look at any combination of permutation of anything I want, and I'm probably going to find what I need. I think that's part of it. Um, but I think consumers still aren't. I mean, obviously, HVAC is the way it is. Like consumers are still going to want to have that local, that local presence that like the local brand and the people who are going to be there to take care of them when right. something goes wrong and provide a quality install. But I think communication around um, install and communication around you know, really, I don't, I don't want to say commoditizing, but you almost have to commoditize every single element of an installation to let the consumer know that this is more than just a box they're putting in. I'm going to take this heat resistant tape and I'm going to run it around each whatever, right? Like those are the things that they're doing that no one's communicating. So to answer that, pricing transparency and really good communication training to let the consumers know what's out of sight, out of mind.
Yeah. The other, the other part on that too, and, you know, we're talking about brand experience and I, uh, I recorded a video yesterday about it's easier to build a brand than it, than it is to build a business. Yep. And, uh, you, when, when you look at that, like, okay, well, if everybody's online, how are you going to distinguish yourself? Well, you need to have a good marketing presence, right? Mm -hmm. You need to have a good brand presence within the market to be able to say, okay, well, if there's company A, company B, company C, they're going to go with company B because they see you everywhere. They know you. They have familiar familiarity. It's a tough word today, uh, <laughs> right? It's yes. not an easy one. Uh, yeah, uh, lack of sleep with a two-month-old. Uh, I had That's right. Sleep last night plus a couple of whiskeys will just destroy my vocabulary <laughs> in a hurry. Um, You're doing but great. When, when you have that familiarity, uh, I nailed it that time. Uh, when you have that familiarity with your brand, people are going to gravitate towards you, even if you might be a little bit higher. I mean, think about it. I have, a, I have a Google Pixel, right? It's half the cost of an iPhone. It does exactly the same thing, but people will buy iPhones, even though they're twice the price, because of the brand familiarity and the name that they've built up. So you can still do that if everybody's online and having this contractor platform, just making sure you have a good brand experience and a good brand recognition in the market. Yep. I agree. Cool. Yeah. It's, and we learned that last year more than ever, like brand is central and brand will be the big differentiator. But again, I think it's, um, giving the customer the, and I, I, I don't like using the word perception because, but the perception that there's transparency and there's, I mean, the idea that to get a really good idea of what it would take to replace your system involves you inviting three people over who may sell different brands and have different presentations and give you di some will give you model numbers, some won't. And you're just left in this, like not knowing another thing too, that, that drives me crazy. Sorry, this isn't, you didn't ask me this question. Now I'm ranting. Hey, it's okay. Get on, do it. I, I believe that there are different segments of the market because there are different segments of the market. So I don't want to exclude anyone when I say this. But I get so frustrated when my neighbors, my friends, my family have to go through the process of um, replacing an HVAC system. And they don't even, they never even find out that two stage exists or variable speed exists or, um, you know, pure airs exist or whatever the IQ, like it really bothers me that like people have to make a decision really quickly. They have limited options. They have this archaic process where they're bringing people into their home and they have this impending discomfort of they're either hot or cold. And it could be a life and death situation, depending on what part of the country you're in. There has to be a way that just like a home and, and I'm again, ranting here, just like someone buying a car right now can quickly orient themselves with, um, with different models and different trim packages and all that super simple, right? If you, you know, this is an F-150 Platinum Limited XLT, it's quick, e easy to orient that through the manufacturer and through the distributor, which is the dealer, right? Mm -hmm. Something's lost because there's not enough pull through of high end efficiency equipment, high end variable speed, two stage modulating stuff. There's not enough pull through getting to the homeowner, right? This, uh, the Super Bowl commercial is not going to do it. It's going to have to be pushed from the contractor because the contractor is who people trust, right? Yeah. So it's just, it's frustrating um, because I'll have friends who end up with single stage 14 seer equipment and they're like, I didn't even know. I have two, look right out this window here. I, I could show it to you. I have two 26 year systems running at full blast. It's 98 degrees out and you can't hear it right now. That's like uh -huh. the biggest air conditioning yeah. flex in the world. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm the only person I know who has those. Like, I don't know anyone else who has those in my neighborhood or in my community. So, anyway. well, so, let me ask you this, then. so why, and, and I have my own opinion on it, but I really want to hear yours. Why is it that you think contractors, technicians are not offering those options and not educating their consumer mm -hmm. on why that might be a better choice? I just, I think there's so much inconsistency with the information that homeowners can get that they get overwhelmed by it. And they're all they see is one seven thousand and one's twenty seven thousand. Hmm. And then there's also the element of, you know, how people are pricing higher seer, high efficiency equipment. Um, right. So, yeah, I, th I think that's that's part of it. So. Yeah, I mean, I recently bought an air conditioner for, for my house. First time, I mean, we live in Canada. You don't really need an air conditioner. We, bu we bought a new house, moved in. Upstairs is like 32 degrees Celsius. Um, convert that into Fahrenheit for what you please. I think that's... Uh, 93? Yeah, about 90. So well, smart. 90. 90. I'm looking outside of my... Uh, I have a, a 
uh, thermometer outside uh, that has it's big in Celsius, small in, in Fahrenheit. So, uh, you know, it's 30, 90 degrees Fahrenheit upstairs. Uh, and it's just like, man, that's hot. So we bought an AC unit. If I didn't do what I did, mm-hmm. I wouldn't know to ask the questions about, hey, do I need a two, two stage? Do I need a variable speed? What type of a, sh- uh, a C rating should I have for my area? And I asked all those questions. But when I got in, I mean, we went with one of our uh, one of our, our customers uh, naturally. Okay. But I got, you know, well, yeah, you get support, right? They support right. us, so support them. But I did get two other quotes. Um, mm-hmm. But guess what? I did all my quotes online. I didn't have a single contractor come over to my house. Nice. Um, and they, and they, I mean, they did it through contactless quotes and taking pictures of stuff. Yep. But one of the, one of the thoughts that I had, and I mean, we see this on the marketing side and some of the stuff that we get taught on here are video sales letters or VSLs. And so perhaps there's a model out there and I'm going to drop a success secret here. That is our, you know, our name for show. This could potentially work for, giving all the options. Hey, why don't you shoot a 10 minute video? I mean, will people watch it? No, maybe not, but you'd actually be surprised at how many people would actually watch it. If you shoot it in a way that puts it is they're in a, they're in their home. And now you can educate the customer either a, before they go through their purchase or, or online and see the pricing or after the fact before they even get to your house. Right. Yep. Yeah. That's and think about idea. what you can think about what you can do with marketing automation now. Mm-hmm. where you can engage a maintenance customer and show just tons of different resources. And I've, I've never seen anyone do like product education. Um, shout out to my marketing team that's doing that stuff now because we're doing great. And I've learned a lot from them. But oh yeah, there's a, ton, there's a ton of opportunity there. Totally. Yeah. Well, and so my, my thought around all of this has always been like, well, can we implement video along the process? So that as someone is making a purchase, they're buying a unit through the website, you know, you can have a video pop up and educate them on, you know, what are the benefits of this system? What are the Mm -hmm. uh, detriments of the system? Have you ever thought of this? And I I like Devin's question here that he just chimed in on too, you know, with having a support function while someone is shopping be beneficial, like having a button on the side saying, you know, would you like a a comfort advisor, a specialist to help you walk you through the process? Um, And then you can hop on a Zoom call with them and you've just got someone in your office who is your best salesperson usually in the first place, right? Um, but now you've got options for people to have that support to walk you through the process. Yes, mm-hmm. the answer is yes, Devin. That, that's like, and that that's the next kind of hybrid model of self-serve. It's self-serve, mm-hmm. but having a place to go when you have more questions, which is, yeah, really smart. And you can it. easily do that. Totally, yeah. I love it. I love that Devin's like just hanging out with us. I I wish we could type him in here. Like I'm pretty sure he doesn't do a lot during the day because we're just constantly texting back and forth. So <laughs> we're except for when we try to call each other, then it's phone tag for a half an hour. Right. What's what's the old saying? Working hard or hardly working? That's right. Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll uh, we'll introduce you guys, Devin, uh, via Facebook Messenger after the show. Yeah. Um, so you guys can have the conversation, or you know what? Uh, great opportunity to shamelessly plug our guest for him. Uh, so contractorcommerce.com is his website you can find him on that by the way we'll put all of these in the show notes uh for whatever platform you're consuming our content on it will be there if you want to call him or text him blow him up 303-217-0859 uh actually i said 303 in there and then 0859 after the end of it but either way you're good (laughs) my canadianism's in there p redmond at contractorcommerce.com Reach out to him on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash paul.redmond.9273. Again, I ripped those fast, so we'll put that on those show notes for you later. Random question, January the time. Uh, is this a, is this, so is this a truly random question? Truly yes. Random. So uh, so we pull, we have a random question generator on the interwebs that we go to. Um, I, like I mean, we pull it before the show, and uh, so that way we know, but we don't, we've never prefaced any of our guests on any of these random questions before. It's completely new, That's completely true. random, and completely off topic. So what's the weirdest conversation you've eavesdropped on? Oh, man. That's a tough one. That's, That's a tough cool. one. I do I don't know. I mean, occasionally from time to time, like when my son is having an argument with his girlfriend or whatever, like I'll just put my ear up to the door. And I'm like, it's not the way to handle that. That's kind of weird. Um, that it's a good thing really like weird. young kids aren't on Facebook anymore, right? Oh, right. it's, it's, it's complete. You're completely safe on Facebook, right? Yeah. Yep, it's for old TikTok. people. <laughs> yeah, we'll keep Twitter for old people. <laughs> yeah. 
That was a really random question. It was. They're usually pretty good. I like that. Was there any one conversation that they were having that you were like, oh my God, I can't believe you're talking about this right now? No, but I will say that, you know, he will throw his parents under the bus to save face all the time. Every time. Every time. Yeah. yeah well, like, a, like a good, like a, like a son would. Um, <laughs> I'm not looking forward to that day. Um, I have an eight, two, two month old son and I'm getting here. If it turns out like me, it's going to be a fucking handful. Uh, yeah. It's, it's yeah. a lot, man. I, I have four and it's boy, girl, boy, girl. And um, I'm by nature, a girl dad. I really mm. am. And um, the, I love my sons. Don't, don't get that wrong. I love them. I just feel a little more pressure. It's a little like, I'm just naturally a girl dad, but yep. it's a lot. It's a lot. You got a lot to look forward to. I won't save yeah. you. I won't save any surprises. <laughs> well, I know. I remember back to what I, I mean, granted, my sister was a, was a hell raiser. So it was like, I had a golden pathway. Uh, through grades like 11 and 12 because she just she did everything imaginable uh, my mom who uh, you know is likely watching the show uh, can attest to that uh, as well uh, that it was my sister who made it really easy for me um, but nonetheless I'm still not looking forward to those days of having a, having a teenage son thinking that he knows the knows the world and knows best and you know he's never wrong yeah you don't have to wait for him to be a teenager for that we got an 11 year old he's already there we got a, I got a six year old boy and he's already there too <laughs> Too shy. Oh, yeah. Too yeah. Shy. Um, sweet. Well, what I'd love to transition to is talking a little bit more about the podcast and your role on there because, and uh, yeah, full transparency. So I, Chris and I have connected before in the past and I, I highly respect him as a business owner and he's an incredibly intelligent man. Um, but I find myself often when I'm listening to any of your episodes saying to myself, Chris, shut up. Like, let's Paul ask the questions here. <laughs> I'm, I'm fascinated by so many of the questions that, that you ask and where they come from. And I mean, I'm a big believer in the quality of your life comes down to the quality of questions you ask yourself, but sure. also the quality of your relationships come down to the quality of questions that you ask of others. And I'm curious where this ability, this yeah. skill set came from and asking amazing thought provoking questions. No, one, thank you so much. Um, someone busted Chris's chop saying, uh, hey man, get to the point. And he's conscious of it. So he's really working on it, but nice. he's got a lot to say. Like, I love it, but yes. um, I'll make sure I give him a hard time. We, he and I have a podcast after this. So um, yeah, thank you again. Um, honestly, man, like I have to give a lot of credit to, um, you know, in about 2016, I started listening to Tim Ferriss, mm-hmm. maybe 2015. If you haven't listened to Tim Ferriss, Tim is a, a, just a, an unbelievable interviewer. Yeah. And so I kind of, I kind of, picked up a little bit from him, but I also, he is who, um, through his interviews really gave me the context and confidence to think bigger about what I'm personally capable of. So like, that's when, you know, I met Chris and was like, Hey dude, let's do some, let's do some big things together. Right. And that was all just kind of leading up of two years of driving, driving all the time and listening to podcasts and hearing these stories of people who start these companies and do these things. And I knew that I couldn't do that in the corporate world. So Hmm. Um, Chris and I got to experience a lot of that together, but anyways, um, yeah, I would say quality of questions, you know, at, at the end of the day, like I'm fascinated by the humanity side of just life. Like, right. We're all people. We all have stuff. We all have junk. Um, I'm particularly interested in like insecurity. If that sounds, that might sound kind of weird. Like I, I mean, all the ego in the world is right in front of us every single day, particularly in all the groups we're in where we're seeing all these things. But like deep down, there's a human being there who's got to make choices and got to do things and may have doubts about themselves. So I'm usually just trying to hear a little bit deeper. Like, I just want to know, like, where was your motivation? Where did it come from? How did it make you feel like, and it truly is. I'm curious. Like I like to learn about people. Um, so yeah, I guess that's kind of where it comes from. But I, I honestly, there, people won't believe this, but Chris and I do not prepare together. Um, we will sometimes collaborate on the pre podcast notes. Sometimes he'll create the notes. Sometimes I'll create the notes. We'll review them a couple days before we'll give each other some like, Hey, let's take it this direction. But it is authentic. Like we tell our guests, like, we're going to start here. And what I like to do is this is how I'll envision it. You can envision this too. Like if I see a guest that's going in a direction and I can hear it in his voice, like I can sense some insecurity or I can sense some hope or optimism, like whatever it is. I picture myself like putting my hands on the back of their shoulders. Like, no, 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 buddy. We're not going back to talking about, we're we're going down this road, right? 
And so then we'll veer off. But like at that point, we've taken the listener on this like deeply personal journey with the person. So I don't know if that answers it. But um, yeah, Chris and I, it just works. We, we just, we get on there, we're authentically ourselves and it kind of works. But thank you for your compliment. No, and I find that, that those are some of the best uh, podcasts that exist where it's not an interview. It's you as a listener are eavesdropping in on a conversation amongst Point. two, three, five people. Um, Fuck, those are the imagine best. five people on a show? It's pretty intense. Oh, I've listened wow. to a few of them. And yeah, they're people constantly shouting over each, each other. other. Yeah. Usually they're done when you're in the same room. It's, it's yes. hard to do those when you're online. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a tendency of not being very conversational. So when someone answers a question, if I'm, if I'm not taking it further, I'll just like, I don't respond with a, with a statement. Right. So that's why you get a lot of questions. Just try, trying to hear more. Cause I have to remind myself that the listeners aren't there to hear me talk. They're there to hear the guest talk, you know? So, totally. but we enjoy it. We love it, man. I, I, I get a lot of joy out of it. Honestly, the podcast is like for, for, I know for me too, same thing, so much joy out of the show. Like when we, when we started this, it was Evan and I sitting around drinking whiskey, talking about our business and our coaching program that we're done. And like, okay, my mom's the only one watching this. This sucks. <laughs> let's, let's bring on a guest. And we didn't even have a name for the show. It was literally just called Whiskey Wednesday. We brought on a few guests and we're like, okay, I think this can gain some traction. And then we started bringing on more people. We renamed it, cut, you know, came up with the, the name and the brand you know, behind it. Now here we are uh, probably close to, I would say in September last year is when we started our, our original whiskey Wednesdays. Um, and so almost, almost a full year, like it's, you sit around you drink whiskey and you shoot the shit with some great, great human beings. Um, and it's extremely humbling. Like, I don't know if you saw um, and you probably get this too, you know, the humble part, um, the, the wisdom and the impact that you can have on others when you don't even know that you're having the impact on others. And like, I was having a conversation with somebody the other day and he's like, you're going to laugh when I tell you my work, we're just, you know, conversing back and forth. Hey, what do you do? He's like, you're going to laugh. He's like, I'm a high school band director. And I I watch your guys' show every single week. He's actually a really close friend of of Jason Julian, one of our clients. Uh, And so, yeah, he says, I'm from Herbert Springs, Arkansas. I'm like, home of Julian Heaton there. He's like, you know what? what? I know Jason Julian really well. Um, But he's just like, your guys' show has helped increase our sales two to three fold so like okay it's hvac success secrets it's fucking life success secrets man business success secrets that consume your content the principles and it's all because of the guests that we have on our show um i mean i'd like to say that it's me i mean that's kind of my ego egotistical comment but really it's our guests yeah um and that's really what makes it yeah no you guys are doing a great job so so what's the vision where are you guys going to take i mean obviously you're you've chosen your niche, HVAC, which I love, like being focused, not chasing the tiny squirrels. Where are you guys taking this thing? Like, obviously, it's not just a podcast. The podcast was always like the the goal behind it is just to add value because we knew as our business, we would never be able to work with everyone. Mm-hmm. So having an opportunity to create a platform where we could impact and leave a legacy um, to overall improve the industry perfect just one one tenth of one percent if we could have that small of an impact the ripple effect of that would be huge yeah um we we took a walk down to the we have a river that flows through edmonton took a walk down there and my six-year-old was throwing rocks and i i passed him a bigger rock i said here chuck this into the water and i want you to watch what happens and so he chucks it into the water and you know the ripple goes out and um i was like that rock represented one nice thing that you said Right. And this was, it was actually someone's post that was on, it was, I, I can't remember who it was. It was another HVAC tech that posted this and so I copied it and stole it. And now it's mine. So too bad. Um, <laughs> but yeah. You threw the rock. I'm like, that's one nice thing that you said to someone and watch the ripple effects that that has of that one kind deed did. And a negative deed has the exact same effect, right? The ripple effects of our actions carry on forever. And so that's truly what the show is all about. It's just, trying to make one small pebble in this massive ocean of uh, HVAC technicians around the world, um, creating one small little ripple and hopefully carrying on and impacting someone in a positive way. No, love that. And that's, I mean, we've chatted about like when Evan and I first started our business, it's like, what's the impact that we want to have? You know, let's provide as much value as you humanistically possibly can uh, to, to people. And, no matter who you are, you can take this message because if you provide value to somebody, 
you're not necessarily going to capture it on the front end. Mm-hmm. And I'm talking like, I mean, my business mind always goes to, to revenue. I mean, that's not what drives me. Money does not drive me. Um, and money is a very limited motivator for, for people. It doesn't drive people, uh, but people think it does, but it actually mm-hmm. doesn't. But if you can provide value first, guess what? You're going to capture all of that on the back end later. It just mm-hmm. takes longer, but you're going to have meaningful relationships. You're going to have meaningful connections and you're going to have meaningful clients, not customers, clients. Because clients know. repeat business, not customers are, in my mind, customers have always been, hey, one-off purchasers. Right. Refer to them as clients. 100%. Good. Good. Sam Wakefield in the house. Loving this. Next guest, guest next week. Take a yeah, good note, so, Sam. I've enjoyed yeah. talking to Sam. I've enjoyed getting to know him. He's a great guy. Another another fellow podcaster and That's amazing right. businessman as well. And I'm excited yep. to have a conversation with him. I know you've been on his show. So uh, yeah, excited to, to have you on, Sam. And thanks for thanks for chiming in, bud. Um, mm, I'm tempted to get into insecurities, but I really don't feel like we have the time to do it. So we might have to save yeah, that not, for another show. I'm not <laughs> feeling it either, man. I'm pretty... <laughs> it's been a long day. I still have one more podcast. Yeah. I want to cry. You got a lot of t- a lot of talking to do. Um, no, this has been a fantastic episode, and I really appreciate you coming on, Paul. It's uh, e-commerce is definitely the way of the future, and it, if you're not getting on it right now, like you are absolutely missing out as a an HVAC business. Um, it's still relatively untapped as of right now, uh, which is unfortunate and yet um, massively opportunistic for a lot of people. So agree. I'm really excited for what uh, where uh, contractor commerce is going to be with you uh, in the position that you're in now. Yeah, thank you. And we'll connect offline. I'll share with you some of the things we're doing and kind of how we're taking this to market and, and what our what our roadmap looks like. Um, I think you guys might find it interesting. So no, I'm very so, fascinated by that. Well, as we wrap things up, we have our famous last question for you. Oh, man. Uh, you're hoping to avoid it, hey? Uh, what is one question you wished people would ask you more, but don't? Oh, great, great question. You know, I love talking about my family. I just love it. Like any questions about my family, my wife, my kids, like, or, you know, even, even just, you know, my, my extended family. So kind of my upbringing and all that I don't talk about. I think a lot of people probably make a lot of assumptions, but um, I have an interesting, interesting road to get where I am today. And, and I love talking about it, but, uh, yeah, good, good question. Well, let's, let's ask this then. Um, I, I'm more, I mean, I want to ask about your, your current family, you know, four kids and a wife. However, I'm more curious about your upbringing because I believe that upbringings shape who we are as individuals, uh, for the future and as adults, um, from that, you know, I'm part of a, a program it's called a uh, hero's hockey. So it's a hockey education reaching out society and it helps um, impoverished, not necessarily impoverished. That's the wrong word. Um, marginalized youth that come from different, different backgrounds, uh, whether that's lower socioeconomic status, broken homes, tough life, etc., and empowering them through the game of hockey to be able to learn life skills and, and changing what they are. Right. So that that's something in terms of the upbringing that is, that is very powerful in near mm-hmm. to me. So let me ask you the question. How has your upbringing shaped who you are today? Really good question. I didn't think that you would actually ask me. I thought this was just a like, hey, what, what question did you want? So um, I was I was born and raised until I was nine in Detroit, Michigan. And if you don't know Detroit, Google mm-hmm. it, but not the best place in the world. I'm sure it was at one point and it's being revitalized, but not the best place. Very, very loving family. I was the youngest of seven children. But they were not all in the same house. So my dad had, and when I say this, I've still, I've yet to meet anyone other than like Sean Kemp who can top this. And if you don't know who Sean Kemp is, just Google it. Um, But my dad had seven children from four different women, which I never thought was weird until I became like in my twenties when someone was like, how many brothers and sisters do you have? And I was like, well, two here and three here and two over there and one over there, I think. And um, so it was, wasn't until later in life that I started to really think through like, okay, how has that shaped my understanding of family and all of that? Now, all that to say, my dad passed away, legendary human being. I've never and will never meet anyone who has anything bad to say about him. So that's Mm. um, just an, and my family is still like, it's almost some days it's like day one of losing him. And it's been 25 years. I think I don't need what, how old am I third? No, it's been about 30 years. Um, So 
being raised in a, in a house with a twin brother who we lost our dad. So my dad, natu- my brother naturally gravitated toward my, gravitated toward my dad. I naturally gravitated toward my mother. And um, I got into sports. My brother didn't. So we just went very two, two different paths. So I, I spent a lot of time kind of thinking through that and thinking about my relationship with my brother who I love dearly. Um, and yeah, I spent a lot of time kind of contemplate, contemplating that. Um, and how that's formed me and shaped me and then how that informs my, the way I operate with my family and, and all that. But mm-hmm. so I say all of that to say the point that I missed. And this goes back to your question about asking about um, how I ask questions on podcasts. So being raised without a dad, I became fascinated by dads. Mm-hmm. Like not in a weird way, just like what do dads do? When do they wake up? What do they do? Where do they, like, how do they pay the bills? How do they, what kind of cars do they drive? What kind of jobs do they do? What do they do at these jobs? Do they come home? Like I was just fascinated. I didn't realize it, but I found myself always kind of like yearning for, you know, male leadership to some degree and understanding and deconstructing fatherhood. Mm -hmm. And so as I've become a dad and my wife and I'll be in a situation with one of the kids and we'll like privately be like, no wonder I didn't think of that. I've never even thought of that. I've never, I didn't, like the concept didn't really occur to me, right? I didn't see that modeled. And so um, I, how I ended up like in sales today, this is, I, I say in sales, like how I gravitated towards sales out of school was I had a family friend and the mom and dad um, were like, hey, you'd be great in sales. And like having someone, this is in seventh grade and having someone or sixth grade, having someone tell you, you'd be great at something. And like, oh, you've identified me and you've told me that like I'd be good at something. And they didn't say their kid would be good at sales. They said I would be good at sales. And so in sixth grade, I was like, I guess I'm going to go into sales. And I guess sales is kind of business. I guess I'm going to go into business. So um, I think about that a lot. Like what if she would have said, um, hey, you would be an amazing orthodontist. I truly think I'd be an orthodontist today. I truly think that. Hmm. So yeah, it's just interesting. I don't know if I answered your question, but um, that's something that I don't talk often about. Mm -hmm. And I'm becoming more and more comfortable with um, kind of deconstructing it from this vantage view, vantage point in this stage of my life and not being like, oh man, I wish this were different, but like really embracing who I am and how I've become a a dad and a family man and all that. So thanks for for asking. Hey, no worries. That's that's what I love about that question is that there's such a variety of questions that we get and we're always going to ask the question to somebody when they when they preface it ahead of time you know one of the things that i like that i know that like you said uh, there i just read it read the tail end and i want um, business owners i think forget this is that sales is business and business is sales so you know you're going to business and that's you know what, what you said well when you're a business owner and you're you're the you're the greatest salesperson there is for your business because you have to drive the bottom line and i think a lot of business owners miss that part of things right because they're like well i'm not in sales well no if you're a business owner you've got to sell your business Mm -hmm. right but not only sell your business everything in life is sales i gotta sell my kid i'm going to bed at eight o'clock you know i've got to uh you know sell my wife on cooking look at that by the way right uh it was an example (laughs) you know i've got to i've got to sell uh, my wife on cooking dinner tonight instead of me, right? And you better way, get good at all this stuff. Yeah, right? you know, really like good. You, you have to be really good at sales <laughs> to be a fucking parent. Um, those are like those, those are two things in my house that, that I don't mess with, man. Like <laughs> making everybody go to bed early and making my yeah. wife cook dinner. Like, yeah, those are <laughs> <laughs> just a See, weird I, move. I, uh, if she, if my wife puts a kiss to bed, guess what? I'll cook dinner all the time because I already cook dinner anyways. Uh, and actually, I like and enjoy the cooking part of things. So. Anyways, the, the point the point of the you know what I was trying to go at is that if you're a business owner, like sales because it's going to be part of your life uh, being a business owner. Yep, hundred percent. Good. Wait well, and I, I I wanted to say as well, um, thank you, and uh, I I truly honor your vulnerabil- vulnerability. Ooh, there there's a tough one. Nailed for it. You. <laughs> one for me. Three whiskeys will do that. Um, but but truly. Uh, thank, yeah, you thank you for that. And thank you for that share. Um, I think it's something that not a lot of people check in with themselves for in, in recognizing who they are today is because of both the great parts of their childhood, but also because of the shitty parts of their childhood. Mm-hmm. And if everyone's parent was truly the ideal parent that they wish they would have been, 
uh, they wouldn't be the person that they are today. And I think that if we're going to blame um, people for their faults, we should also blame intelligently and blame eloquently for who it is that we are today. So thank you so much for, for sharing the way that you did, Paul. Yeah, you bet. Thank you, guys. Love it. Thank you for cornering me into being vulnerable. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> I, you know, and I was thinking about this, we almost need to do a future episode uh, just about vulnerabilities uh, yeah. and feelings and actually communicating about those. Um, I'm not now because, well, I'm a couple of whiskeys deep and I think that's a sober conversation uh, <laughs> uh, on that. Or so, it could be more vulnerable and open if you're drunk. Who knows? Truly, right? truly you Tuesdays. Know? Yeah. One, of, one of my one of my best one of the truly Tuesdays. There we go. Start a new start a new show. Uh, but one of my one of my best friends came out. We're on a, we were on his thirty. This is years ago on his thirtieth birthday, and he came on last night. And he was just crying and crying and crying. We're like, oh fuck, who died? And he's just like, I love all of you guys so much. And like, it's 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 crazy how sometimes we need alcohol or whatever your vice is to truly express your emotions. Yeah. No, you don't need that. If you're you're a better person, and I'm gonna say man because most of it is guys having a tough time expressing their emotions, you're a better man for being vulnerable and expressing your emotions and your needs when you're sober. Yeah. Don't get drunk to be able to cry and do it. Do it when you're sober and tell the people the most dear and true to your heart. Yep. Yes. There you go. All right. As as we wrap up, thank you again, uh, Tom Paul, for being on the show. Uh, yeah, thank you guys. Much, very much appreciate it. And until next time, cheers. All right. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Hey, thanks for watching another episode of HVAC Success Secrets Revealed. Before you go, two quick things. One, join our Facebook group, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash HVAC Revealed. The other thing. If you took one tiny little bit of information out of this that was a golden nug for you and your business, all we ask is for you to introduce this show to one person on your contacts list. That's it. That's all. One person. So they too can unleash the ultimate HVAC business. Until next time. Cheers.